Welcome back to Helicopter Lessons in 10 minutes or less. I'm Jacob. In this video, I'll be talking about the height velocity curve, also referred to as the dead man's curve. Now, just a side note before I get started, just want to let you guys know I recently launched a new ebook study guide covering tons of the topics that I include in my videos. Just kind of outlines them in a uh, quick, easy to read ebook format, but I'll put a link to that in the description below if you're interested. But without further delay, let's get started with the height velocity curve. Now just about every operator's manual has a diagram that looks something like this. On the left side, you're gonna have something that covers your altitude. On the bottom, it's gonna outline your airspeed. And then you're gonna have some sort of curve that looks something like this. Now here in the bottom, let's say you have your, your zero for your altitude going all the way up to say 500 feet or so, counting down all the way down here, airspeed, see so starting 10, 20, 30, 40, so on and so forth, ticking up. So what does this mean? Well, the chart has a few names associated with it. It's the height velocity curve, the avoid area, the dead man's curve, but generally it outlines the area of certain altitudes and velocity combinations that you wanna stay away from because if an engine does fail, the likelihood of a safe landing is unlikely. This means if you have to auto-rotate, it's very unlikely that you can safely do it. Now, the reason for this is that, say if you're flying at, I don't know, say 300 feet and 25 knots, so somewhere around right there on the curve. If you're flying at this, uh, this type of profile, your engine quits, there's just not enough kinetic or potential energy in the form of airspeed and altitude, respectively, to safely auto-rotate. So you don't have enough altitude to trade off, you don't have enough airspeed to trade off, you're just gonna pretty much plummet towards the ground in an uncontrollable fashion, also known as some kind of forced landing because you didn't have a choice in it. So that being said, what I'd like to outline in this video is what exactly does the curve cover um, as far as what is it based on, what's not mentioned, as well as some other considerations. So first off, let's talk about some of the, some of the factors that it's based on. Now, every helicopter's uh, operator's manual is gonna have this in here um, that or if it is in there, it has to be certified. And this is certified under the helicopter's maximum gross weight. Now, why is that? Well, this is supposed to be the worst case scenario uh, depicted in the event that you're operating at the helicopter's maximum operating weight. Um, anything less than that, this curve would be slightly shrunken down a little bit more to the left, uh, not as big of a curve. All right, so the next factor that it's based off of is that it's based on the performance of an average pilot. Now this is a proficient pilot. This is not a pilot in training. This is one who understands you know, how to do an auto rotation, what the signs are. Uh, but generally, the, um, the chart gives you a little bit of a uh, uh, little bit of leeway above what's called the knee of the chart, where it's built in with about a one second delay between an engine failure and the pilot inputting a corrective action. Anything below the knee is just requiring that immediate instinctive action by the pilot to re recover the helicopter. Now that said, this is just a, a baseline of what you can expect under the max gross weight and the average pilot conditions. But uh, there are some people who are, say, extraordinary pilots or th those who claim that they can beat the curve. You know, they can be operating inside the curve, have an engine failure, and safely land it. Now, I wouldn't recommend ever pushing your luck trying to operate in this region. Uh, just thinking that you can beat the curve because this is uh, done by pilots who know the exact indications and symptoms of engine failure, usually a second or two before it happened. They can hear it. They see it in the instrumentation before it actually takes place in the rotor, and they react accordingly, instantly putting in that corrective action as if they're spring-loaded and ready for it to happen. All right, so moving on to what the chart doesn't show you or what is not explained. Now, it doesn't really say it in the charts, but all of these uh, height velocity diagrams are tested. They're, they're verified by the flight engineers, people who designed this helicopter, and they're all to a run-on landing or a roll-on landing if your aircraft has wheels. That said, if it's a roll-on landing, it has suitable surface conditions. Now, we're not always operating above a, uh, a nice flat runway. So the guarantee that your auto is survivable is not necessarily there if you're operating in other areas. Uh, secondly, just because you're outside the curve, it doesn't necessarily mean you're safe in the event of an engine failure. 
Now, while being outside the curve, you could still have an engine failure over there. Uh, you know, an area like a wooded area, a lake, rocky terrain, stuff like that. You may be able to safely auto, but it doesn't guarantee you're going to survive the auto at the end. Um, being outside the curve just means that you have the potential to make it to the Earth's surface in a smooth and controlled fashion instead of just plummeting to the Earth's surface if you're potentially caught up here in the height velocity or the dead man's curve. Uh, lastly, uh, not all the, sh uh, the diagrams cover pressure altitude. A lot of these diagrams are based off just a sea level uh, testing of the helicopter. Uh, going up to altitude 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 feet, this diagram is going to get elongated to the right and a little bit higher, increasing your airspeed and altitude covered in this, uh, this avoid region. Um, just because of the density of the air, the, the helicopter cannot grab a hold of as much air. Its, its performance is not going to be as good as if it's operating at sea level. So keep that in mind as far as in this diagram, this is not necessarily applying if you're going and flying in some high altitude areas. Now, the last thing I want to or want to cover is some additional considerations. All right, so... Um, and some charts, you're going to see another little area depicted here. Say I'm in this area right here. This is going to be your high speed, low altitude. Now, the reason it's, it's depicted, once again, height avoid area. If you do have an engine failure, the success rate of actually landing that helicopter is pretty low. And this is in some diagrams because they figure if you're operating this this fast, this low to the ground, you just may not have enough reaction time to safely uh, recover the aircraft. Now, some some operators manual include or operators manuals include this. Some of them don't. Some just include uh, the simple uh, bell curve or this height velocity curve or whatever, um, because it's probably the the most dangerous. Because if you're high speed, low altitude, you're probably focused outside, probably focused on flying the helicopter. Whereas if you're a stationary 300 foot hover, maybe doing a hoist operation, you may not be focused at your instrumentation. You may be looking down, trying to make sure that you're, you know, lowering a hoist or your, your focus is somewhere other than your instrumentation or your helicopter. So that's why this is, uh, this is always depicted and this is only sometimes depicted. Also, uh, dual engine helicopters usually have a slightly smaller curve depicted in their operator, operator's manual. It's gonna look something like this. So maybe instead of 500, Maybe it's closer to like 200 feet, uh, maybe into the 20 to 25 uh, knot range. And this is if an engine fails, um, maybe still in the same parameters, the 300 feet and 25 knots, the helicopters can still uh, continue forward flight um, under a single engine condition. But if that second engine were to go out, maybe you had a fuel issue and one engine flamed out and then shortly later another engine's gonna flame out. If you're still in this entire single engine flight, or height avoid region. Uh, once again, it's a bad place to be. Safely landing that helicopter is gonna be unlikely. But for dual engine helicopters, this region is gonna be slightly uh, shrunken. Uh, so that covers the, uh, the dual engine considerations. Last thing I wanna cover for the considerations is that some federal regulations outline that intentionally operating in this avoid region is breaking an aircraft limitation and therefore should be avoided at all times. Now this usually applies to larger, heavier multi-passenger helicopters and not so much uh, your smaller commercial helicopters. But that wraps up the height velocity slash dead man's curve. It's simply an area that you may want to avoid or just not linger in because it's unlikely that you can safely recover the helicopter if you do lose an engine. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit like and subscribe below. Uh, once again, I'm Jacob and this has been Helicopter Lessons in 10 Minutes or Less. Safe flying.